Come on in, my dear friend. Welcome to your breakthrough right here. Now we're celebrating, we're commemorating God's greatest gift, the sacrifice paid by his only begotten son on Calvary's cruel and rugged beam. The cross, that's the place where God's unfathomable provision intersects with our deepest and most basic human need. Atop that hillside on the outskirts of Jerusalem is the answer to the question many are still asking today. Does God really love me? Not mankind, but me. The cross, my friend, is where the furious love of God encounters our broken and shattered hearts. The gospel is simply this. God loves you. Hold on now, just as you are. Wounded, frightened, angry, lonely, empty. The cross and our Lord's resurrection from the dead proves it to be so. God loves you. Yes, it does. In the morning sun and in the evening rain, without boundary and without limit, that's the Jesus of the Gospels. Celebrate this boundless, unspeakable gift today with my resurrection season message, The Cross, One Man, One Tree, One Friday. Now, you're going to lock in here with me because I got a word for you. I'm going to begin in Galatians 3.13. It's one of the most powerfully profound verses in your Bible. I pray it every morning, <clears throat> and I pray it every night. It is simply this, Christ. Now, I could stop right there and preach a long, long time. Christ, the anointed one and his yoke-destroying burden removing anointing. God's in control. So Christ, did you get it? The anointed one and his yoke destroying, burden removing anointing. Christ has redeemed us. To redeem means to pay the sacrificial price. Oh, it cost heaven something for your salvation. It's free to you but it didn't cost God something. It cost him everything. He returned you, redeemed you, returned you to the original state of affairs. Good God, I wish I had more time tonight. Here's what I want to tell you. What Christ did in his coming, his death, his resurrection from the dead is greater, and you better hear this preacher tonight, is greater than what Satan did to the first Adam. Jesus is the second Adam, and I'm telling you, he's coming tonight to take everything off you the devil put on you and put back on you everything the devil took off. He has redeemed you. Somebody shout his praises. I can hear you. Yeah, shout his praises. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, here it is, cursed is anyone that hangs upon a tree. Jesus was crucified on a tree. Did you understand? He had to be crucified on a tree. It had to be a cross to fulfill Bible prophecy. Some folks say, why, 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 could, why didn't Jesus die by some other means? He couldn't. The prophet said concerning him that he would pay the sacrificial price for our joy, our freedom, our peace, our victory, our financial supply, our protection from COVID-19 and every other coronavirus and every other sickness and disease, every other pain and malady, every other malfunction and infirmity. We are believing tonight that one drop of his blood, when that Roman centurion thrust in his side that sword and withdrew it, 
Your Bible said forthwith came water to the front and to the back, some to the front part, some to the back part. And when one red rivulet of that blood dropped off his toe into a bloody pool on the earth, he shouted, you are healed. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Here it is now. For without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9, 22, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now, let me tell you something. I have no more need of your prayer to the man upstairs or your religion or your Pentecostal religion or any other kind of religion than I do a Shinto shrine, a Hindu cow, or a New Age crystal. There is only one name, my God, I can hear you shouting, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus and his blood and his blood alone. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. We preach, some folks ask, what does Pastor Rod preach? I'm about to tell you. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. I just described you the culture that we live in today. That cross, it's the hinge upon which the door of all human history swings open. It's the pivot round about which the events of the eternal ages revolve. It is the fulcrum of God's grand and glorious lever 4,000 years in the crafting where one man on one tree on one Friday pried a fallen human race out of the unyielding hands of the diabolical devil, Satan himself. Now I'm talking tonight, and I don't get to do it nearly enough, about the cross. <laughs> Rough and rugged, ragged and mean, angry and biting beam. It's here at the intersection of these two rough-hewn beams that we look with horrified wonder upon the raw ferocity of the love of God. Two beams, one stands vertical, one's horizontal. The first reaching to the heights of the heavens and to the depths of hell. That cross beam, horizontal, parallel to the surface of the earth, reaching out and wrapping his loving arms around all of creation. Notice the imagery here. Take just a moment, would you, on Good Friday and think about it. Vertically, we connect to God, but how we miss the horizontal. Horizontally, we collect, connect to our fellow man. Vertically, we see redemption. Horizontally, we see relationship. Vertically, we see righteousness. Horizontally, we see justice. Vertically, we see salvation. Horizontally, we see transformation. I, I feel like running up in this empty some raw tabernacle right now. Vertically, we have faith. Horizontally, we live in faithfulness. Vertically, we have the atonement, but horizontally, we have forgiveness. It's the place right here at the intersection of those two rough beams where conviction joined hands with compassion, where truth married mercy to reach the sinner and transform the saint, to impact the culture and redeem the entire world. The silence of the Lamb has ended and the shout of the saints rings out at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now when I don't have a dollar to change and now when she slams the door and says she's never coming back and now when the test comes back positive for COVID-19, and now I am happy all the day. Why? 
years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not. My Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my heavy burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary, at Calvary. Now this cosmic crossroads sits atop a skull-shaped hill right near a garbage dump just outside the city walls of the capital of a troubled backwater province on the very periphery of the vast Roman Empire. Look now on that center stake. There is a solitary figure, the Son of God, the Prince of Heaven. He's alone. Some of you during this time are feeling alone, but not the loneliness that he felt. As alone and as abandoned as any human person had ever been or would ever be. The cross, you see, it's central. It's central to the message of Christianity. It is the irrefutable evidence of God's incandescent holiness and his immeasurable, watch this preacher, love. It's the place where God's limitless provision intersects with our most basic human need. It's there where the furious love of God encounters our broken and our shattered hearts. There is no Christianity without that bleeding, bloody, angry, mean, biting beam. Without the cross, there is no hallmark of authentic Christianity. It's a life-giving gospel that we find at the cross. In the 21st century, especially in America, uh, the cross has gone missing. We're a post-Christian culture now, we're told. The last thing anyone in polite society would ever want to do is to offend the delicate sensibilities of the skeptic, the atheist, or the agnostic. Well, they need to move aside tonight because this is my night. This is the night I proclaim there is no other name whereby we must be saved. Oh, the blood, oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. No other fount I know, no other fount I know, nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So you'd think surely, you know, in our churches, this is why I built the great Calvary Memorial with the help of our great congregation and our worldwide congregation through Breakthrough. I built it because I thought surely in our churches, surely there we would find a bastion where the cross is treasured, where the cross is honored in both display and proclamation. Uh, if only, if only that were true. In a nation where a cross at one time topped the peak of every church steeple from sea to shining sea, the cross has fallen sharply out of fashion. Even on this Good Friday, you couldn't find a handful of preachers that will talk about his suffering, his sighing, his crying, his dying, the unestimable price of his precious spotless blood without which we could never be saved. Thank God for the blood, the cross. It, you know, they say it, it's just old school. 
you know. Millennials, they don't want to hear about the cross. They don't want to hear about the suffering. They don't want to hear about a dying, expiring Savior <laughs> stretching up and <laughs> slinking down and wheezing and bleeding and sighing and dying. Oh, no, no, it's just, it's, it's, it's just too ugly a scene to contemplate. It's implications of sin and sin's toll on humanity. The severe demands of cosmic justice are just too troubling to ponder for very long. So for pastors, got a few of you watching, for pastors who are eager to appeal to an image conscious public, Placing the cross in prominence, oh, no, no, no. That's poor marketing. Ah, that's just bad branding. And so the cross is disappearing from our cityscapes, from our churches, from our platforms, from our music, from our sing, singing, from our platforms, but in a way more troubling sense. We've been voluntarily removing it from our hearts, from our minds, silently and steadily and stealthily, without fanfare, without debate. We've slipped the cross out of our daily living. It's gone. Well-intentioned efforts to reach the 21st century modern church have resulted in the production, hear me, of a crossless Christianity. Never before, never since, has such love been placed on open display. Words fail, the intellect staggers, the heart begins to question. Here's the question, how could God love me? All of the theories of atonement are but probings into the mystery of a love that did not have to be, but was. The great Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it this way, come believer and contemplate this sublime truth proclaimed in simple monosyllables, no big words, he laid down his life for us. For you. For everybody in that room right now. For that one out in the kitchen right now and that dad in the garage not paying attention. Jesus died for you. The ground of all beings shook and trembled. The source of all life, the heart of all love burst wide open. You see, your Christian faith, my dear brother, my dear sister, sir, ma'am, your Christian faith and mine don't make one ounce of sense unless we know in the very depth of our being and believe that Jesus loves us. No, 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 no. His plea to the wounded, his cry to the broken, come now, you wounded, you frightened, you angry, you lonely, and I'll meet you where you are. I'll meet you right where you live. Come to me not as you should be. Because every one of us on this Good Friday know this for sure. We are never going to be as we should be. So do you really believe it? I mean, think about it for a moment. Contemplate it. See law. Revolve it over and around in your mind and in your heart. At this very moment, do you really believe that Jesus loves you, not your neighbor, not Pastor Rod, 
Not the person that sits in front of you at church. Not the world. Not even the city or your street. Do you believe that he loves you with no regret? Do you believe that he loves you no matter who you know or don't know, no matter where you've been or where you haven't been, do you believe that God loves you? Well, I can answer that for you by telling you that God has an issue. He just can't stop loving you. This this that I proclaim to you on this Good Friday evening, this is the love of our Father expressed through the unspeakable and priceless gift of his only begotten Son, nailed by tempered spikes through tortured skin into splintered wood. And with the ring of every hammer strike, I love you, bolted there with welcoming arms outstretched, announcing to the question, do I love you? See him say to you tonight, how much do I love you? I love you this much. To give his life a billion times, he shouts from that cross, I love you, I love you, I love you. I loved you yesterday and I'll love you tomorrow. I love you forever. I love you forever through every storm and every tempest, every temptation, through every struggle. I love you. I love you in life and living. I love you in death and in dying. And I will not leave you on this earth without me, nor will I remain in heaven without you. I'll meet you at the intersection of these two rough hewn wooden beams. And you and I, says the savior of the world from Calvary's tree, you and I will never ever be separated again. What a good Friday blessing to remember that cross. Let me remind you of something else. We make the gospel so complicated. It's so very simple. Jesus said, come to me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Dear friend, your weight is over. And on that tree, he lifted your weight. Let me make it very plain to you. Give me two minutes. Every single person, every single person, is going to live forever. Now, right now everybody's talking about how many people have been infected with COVID-19, how many people are hospitalized, how many people are in intensive care, and how many people have perished. But I, I, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how many are still alive? Lest we forget that when the breath leaves our body and our eyes close to open again, never in this world, we have just begun to live. God created you in his image. You are an eternal being and you're going to spend eternity somewhere. I believe that every single person that I'm speaking to you right now to, right now by the millions, that every one of you are going to heaven. I have Bible on it. You're going to go to heaven. You say, Pastor Rod, this is some false doctrine. 
You're telling everybody that they're going to heaven. No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You just haven't allowed me to finish my sentence. Everybody's going to live forever somewhere. Your Bible only gives clear directions to eternal destinations, and it only speaks of two. One, a place called heaven, where we leap like a heart over the everlasting hills of God's glory to suffer, sigh, cry, die no more. The other, a place called hell. A place of the eternal separation of human persons for eternity, separated from God, separated from light, separated from life. In fact, your Bible says God would have to give you a body that was fit or able to endure the destruction for eternity. The Bible says hell is a place where your veins become nothing more than strings upon which Satan himself will play the diabolical tune of hell's unalterable lament. Hell is a place where your veins become nothing more than highways for the hot feet of pain. But I've got good news for you on this good Friday. He shed his blood for you. There's no reason for you to go to hell. You're going to go to heaven and stand before God. And he's going to say, enter in my good and faithful servant or depart from me. I never knew you. 90% of the people that before this virus hit were walking the streets of America, 90% of them proclaimed they believe in God. 40% of them say they believe in a place called heaven. But only 4% of them say they believe in a place called hell. We've had faulty preaching. Yeah. The Bible isn't what you want it to be. God said what he meant and meant what he said. Yeah. And tonight, I'll remind you that Jesus spoke 10 times more on the subject of hell than he did the subject of heaven. So I don't know what's going on with preachers today. Well, I know you always wait on it on your breakthrough. So here's today's takeaway. I want you to remember this. The only thing Jesus ever abandoned was an empty tomb. Tweet that. Follow me, won't you, on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Let all your friends know. I'll see you next time on your breakthrough. Valor Christian College wants you to become a world changer with a four-year fully accredited Bachelor of Arts in Christian Ministry. You'll become a part of a vibrant community of believers with a passion for quality education, purpose-driven application, and a desire to receive an impartation of the legacy of Dr. Rod Parsley. Call or visit valorcollege.edu and enroll today on campus or online. Ask about our scholarships, federal financial aid, and other programs to help you acquire the tools you need to change the world. Breakthrough with Rod Parsley is made possible because of the faithful monthly support of Revival Covenant Partners. Thank you. To learn more, visit rodparsley.com.